मैं कि आग लग रही है इसमें क्या जला रहे हो मन की मुर्गा जला रहे हो क्या बकरा जला रहे हो नहीं मन की भैया मन की इसमें मुर्दा फुक रहा है मैं इतने कह कह आकर लो July 2, 1995, marks the day when New Delhi, the bustling capital city of India, became a stage for a horror that would haunt the country for ages. Within this vibrant city, a love story took a sinister turn. Tandoor, a clay urn-shaped oven meant for creating culinary delights, became the ominous centerpiece in a gruesome crime. Instead of cooking chicken, a husband would grill his own wife at 500 degrees and to make it even more gruesome, he applied butter to turn her into ashes. This is India's most infamous true crime story, which unfolded between the prominent areas of Connaught Place and Karol Bagh, situated in New Delhi. The region around Ashaka Road and Janpath Road near Karol Bagh in New Delhi is a bustling neighborhood characterized by its blend of residential serenity and commercial vigor. Known for its diverse community and lively atmosphere, this place offers diverse cultures, traditions, and modern conveniences. Ashaka Road leads directly to the majestic India Gate, while the Janpath area is known for hosting local cuisines and bustling markets. The area boasts a mix of residential complexes, local markets, and small businesses that cater to the daily needs of its residents. It mostly thrives with the presence of various eateries serving delectable local cuisine, adding a flavorful essence to the neighborhood. And one such famous place was Bagia Barbecue Restaurant in Hotel Ashok Yatri Niwas, which later became the Hotel Indra Prathsa. However, this renowned restaurant was soon to become the center stage for a chilling incident that would later be recognized as the Tandoor Khand or the Tandoor Case. Around 11.25 p.m. on July 2, 1995, Ashaka Road in Janpath, New Delhi was getting quieter. Two policemen, Constable Abdul Nazir Kunju and Home Guard Chandler Paul, were patrolling the area. As they got closer to the Ashak Yatri Niwas Hotel, Kunju noticed flames coming from some nearby buildings. Concerned about a potential fire outbreak, the duo swiftly embarked on an investigation. Kunju made his way towards the main entry gate of Yatri Niwas, making a beeline for the front of the Bagia Barbecue Restaurant, situated on the left, just inside the hotel's main entryway. From this vantage point, he observed flames emanating from the rear kitchen area of Bagia. As he approached, a uniformed security guard intercepted him, already briefed about the situation. The guard explained that the fire originated from ignited waste paper and cardboard near the outdoor tandoor reassuring Kunju that everything was under control and there was no cause for alarm. Satisfied with the explanation, policeman Kunju and Chandra Paul proceeded to walk away towards John Puth Lane. As they began to move, Anaru Devi, a middle-aged vegetable vendor often seen showcasing her produce beside the Mother Dairy milk booth at the lane's entrance from Ashaka Road, hurriedly approached them. मलकी मुर्गा जला रहे हो का बकरा जला रहे नहीं और तू जब बड़ी पंतानी है मैंने की भैया मलकी इसमें मुर्दा फुक रहा है मैं इतनी कह कह आकर लो With her voice trembling in fear Anaru exclaimed about the hotel being on fire Her panicked outcry had attracted the attention of several men nearby who also began to raise the alarm Kunju realized how serious the situation had become upon seeing the size of the fire the flames were already clearly visible from the lane, showing that it was more than just a small fire, with thick smoke soaring high, reaching to about 30 to 35 feet above Bagia's outer wall on Janpath Lane. Kunju and Chander hurried back to the closed restaurant's entrance. By that time, Kunju started quietly cursing as he expressed his frustration, mentioning that those involved were attempting to burn the entire hotel down. Kunju then moved beyond the hotel entrance and approached the canvas screen situated in front of the Bagia barbecue. Upon lifting the screen and gazing into the dimly lit restaurant, he encountered a slender man, approximately in his late twenties or early thirties, standing about five foot ten inches tall and attired in a white kurta, a traditional Indian garment. This man casually informed Kunju that they were just burning some old posters and reassured him that the fire was under control. He mentioned that they had taken adequate precautionary measures and there was no reason to worry. 
Despite the man's reassurance, Constable Kunju remained unconvinced. He left Chandra Paul near the hotel and quickly made his way to a nearby phone booth, only to find it closed. He then jogged towards the police picket situated at the rear of the Western Court Complex, located a couple of hundred meters away. Once there, he urgently relayed a wireless report of the fire to the Connaught Place Police Station and made calls to the police control room and the fire brigade, requesting immediate assistance. Upon his return to the hotel, Kunju was dismayed to witness that the blaze had escalated during his absence, with thick smoke rising high above the hotel complex. With Chandra accompanying him, they marched towards the entrance of the restaurant and assertively demanded entry to inspect the fire. Once more, the men at the restaurant refused to allow him entry. Determined, Kunju wouldn't be discouraged this time. Pretending to retreat from the Bhagya, he and Chandra Paul exchanged secretive words as they walked away together from the front of the hotel. Rushing down John Poth Lane, they swiftly scaled the seven-foot-high wall at the restaurant's rear without hesitation. Clearing the bamboo screen fencing, Kunju managed to enter the covered rear area of the garden restaurant. Without delay, they headed straight for the fire. The fire presented an alarming and disproportionate scene within the kitchen. Fueled by a heap of wooden logs, planks, and assorted materials piled atop the tandoor, it blazed with ferocity. One slender man, the same individual who had earlier dismissed Kunju at the front of the Bhagya, was actively fueling the flames using wooden beams and bamboo poles. Another man, dressed in a blue-printed shirt, and a muscular young man stood nearby. At a distance, adjacent to the canvas screen by the hotel's entrance, stood a robustly built man wearing white. Curiously, these individuals appeared entirely indifferent to the foul smell emanating from the inferno. Kunju warned the man stoking the flames, cautioning him about the potential risk of causing a fire that could engulf the entire hotel. Upon being informed by the individual tending to the fire about his affiliation as a Congress Party worker engaged in burning old materials, including posters and waste paper, Kunju remained composed. Instead of being deterred by the political association, he immediately looked around for a bucket. This marked a moment where the young constable truly showcased his determination. Some individuals might have hesitated upon hearing about the political connection, particularly with the influential Congress party. They might have offered a mild caution about fire safety before ultimately withdrawing. However, Kunju stood firm. He was alarmed by the considerable blaze before him and, alongside Chandra Paul, swiftly gathered any available buckets and containers. They filled these from a nearby kitchen tap and promptly began extinguishing the flames. Soon, Sub-Inspector Rajesh Kumar arrived at the scene just as Kunju and Chandra Paul were diligently working to suppress the fire. Interestingly, unlike the attempt to dismiss a constable earlier, no one dared to send a Sub-Inspector away. Accompanied by two security guards from the main hotel, Rajesh and his constables entered the restaurant and joined Kunju in combating the blaze. Working together, they successfully extinguished the fire within a matter of minutes. The intense flames had ignited certain plastic-coated overhead cables, causing further damage. Carrying along the person seemingly responsible for the mischief, Kunju, Sub-Inspector Rajesh Kumar, and the hotel guards proceeded to investigate the extent of the cable damage. Their objective was to determine whether the fire had spread to the building's first floor. They advanced towards the main lobby of Yatri Niwas, which led to the Coconut Grove restaurant. Ascending two flights of stairs, they reached the lower split-level first-floor terrace overlooking the Bagia complex. Constable Kunju leaned over the edge of the mezzanine roof in search of the wires that had caught fire. Instead, he was met with a rush of hot air and foul-smelling folk billowing upwards. To his surprise, he noticed that the fire above the tondor, which they had previously extinguished, had reignited. The man he had observed earlier in the Bagia, the sturdy individual clad in white, was once again fueling the flames. Kunju's initial alarm transformed into exasperation at the careless disregard for safety displayed by these people. Hurrying to the rear edge of the roof without considering the steep drop below, he leapt down, landing forcefully on the paved rear courtyard of the restaurant. Swiftly advancing towards the fire, he pushed aside the wicked fence obstructing his way and approached the tandoor from the rear. Upon reaching the kitchen area, Kunju discovered that the man in the kurta pajama and his two companions had vanished, 
Yet, the fire continued to rage. It was at this moment that Kunju noticed a peculiar scent. Amidst the pungent and unpleasant odor, a distinct smell of roasted meat filled the air. However, this scent was not of ordinary food cooking. Rather, it carried the unmistakable and haunting odor of burning flesh. When he examined the oven, instead of finding chicken meat being prepared, they came across something profoundly disturbing. The oven contained a human body, dismembered and partially burnt. This unsettling discovery reverberated throughout the city, leaving its residents deeply disturbed and shocked. Now two key questions surfaced. Who might the body have belonged to, and who could have been responsible for this gruesome deed? And so began the quest for information regarding the disturbing Tandur Khand. The dismembered and burned body parts underwent testing, and upon receiving the results, the victim's identity was unveiled. She was 29-year-old Naina Sahini. Naina, a Congress worker in New Delhi, was married to 34-year-old Sushil Sharma, who was also a youth Congress leader. The initial post-mortem, conducted at Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi, concluded that the cause of death was burn injuries. Subsequently, a second post-mortem was ordered by the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. This examination was carried out by a team of three doctors from different hospitals, led by T.D. Dagra. During this examination, two bullets were discovered in the head and neck region, leading the conclusion that the cause of death was due to firearm injuries. Now, as per protocol, the police intended to meet with Sushil Sharma, but he was nowhere to be located. However, the same fate did not befall the man who was involved in burning the remains at the hotel. The individual responsible for burning the remains was apprehended and identified as Kishav Kumar, the restaurant manager of the Bagia Hotel. It didn't take long for him to disclose the identity of the other person involved, who indeed turned out to be Naina's husband, Sushil Kumar. The case seemed close to resolution almost immediately upon the initial disclosures. Yet the grim and sinister nature of this case cast a long shadow over the city, leaving a haunting impact for a prolonged period. A few days later, on July 10, 1995, Sushil Sharma surrendered. Now all that remained was to uncover the events that transpired on the day Naina was killed and ensure that justice was served. During the interrogation, it was disclosed that Sushil and his wife Naina had a friend named Matlub Karim. Matlub and Naina had been classmates and were colleagues in the Congress party, sharing a close bond. However, Sushil disapproved of Naina's friendship with Matlub. Arguments frequently arose between the couple over this issue, but his possessiveness took a much darker turn on the night of July 2, 1995. On that tragic night, upon returning home, Susil encountered Naina conversing on the phone while consuming alcohol. As Naina noticed Susil's presence, she ended the call abruptly. In a fit of anger, Susil redialed the phone and discovered Matlub on the other end of the line. Enraged beyond control, and despite Naina's attempts to explain, Susil fatally shot her. Subsequently, he wrapped the body in a plastic bag, placed it in the trunk of his Maruti 800 car, and proceeded to transport it to the Bagia Barbecue Restaurant, and conspired with the restaurant manager, Keshav Kumar, to dispose of it. Naina's body was dismembered and then incinerated in a tandoor oven. With this information gathered, along with a few DNA tests to confirm the killer's identity, Sushil Sharma was soon to face the legal proceedings in court. The Delhi police conducted an investigation into the case and submitted a charge sheet on July 27, 1995 in a Sessions Court. Subsequently, on November 7, 2003, Sushil Sharma was sentenced to death, while the restaurant manager, Keshav Kumar, received seven years of rigorous imprisonment. Sushil appealed against the district court's verdict in the Delhi High Court, yet the High Court upheld the decisions made by the lower courts. His death sentence was subsequently confirmed by the Delhi High Court in 2007. However, in 2013, the Supreme Court commuted his death sentence, citing the absence of evidence that Sushil had dismembered his wife's body. On October 8, 2013, a three-judge bench consisting of Chief Justice Satha Sivam, 
and Justices Ranjana Desai and Ranjan Gogi upheld Sharma's conviction. There is relief for uh, Sushil Sharma. The uh, Supreme Court has in fact commuted the death sentence to life. It's going to be a life term now for Sushil Sharma. This, of course, is the extremely infamous 1995 uh, Tandoor case uh, where uh, the uh, victim was uh, Naina Sharma and uh, now the Supreme Court has commuted the death penalty to a life term. The court reduced his death sentence to life imprisonment due to Sushil's lack of a prior criminal record and the nature of the crime. Although both the trial court and the high court had ordered Sushil Sharma's execution, the Supreme Court modified the sentence, stating, It is not a crime against society but a crime committed due to his strained relationship with his wife. On December 21, 2018, the Delhi High Court issued an order for the immediate release of Sushil Sharma. The court questioned whether a person could be detained indefinitely for a murder offense even after completing a designated sentence. However, by that time, Sushil had already been released after serving 23 years in jail. According to Sushil, if he hadn't committed the crime, he believed he could have potentially become a union minister. After his release from jail, Sushil appeared to have changed as a person, yet one cannot really know the truth that lurks beneath the superficial demeanor. 90% people don't control the situation, they don't know how to control the situation. If they are wrong, then they are a crime, and if they are wrong, then they are wrong, and they are wrong, then they are wrong, then they are wrong. So they teach them to stay in jail, they teach them to stay in jail, they teach them to stay in discipline, तो महात्मा गांधी का एक कोट मैंने पढ़ा जेल में एक उनकी कोटिंग पढ़ी कि अगर जैसे हम जेल में रहते हैं अगर वैसे हम बाहर रहें तो कोई समस्या कभी नहीं होगी। When questioned about the dismemberment of Naina's body after the murder and the events of that night, here's what Sushil had to say. काफी बातें सामने आई इसमें कहा जाता है कि टुकड़े किए गए उसका तंदूर में जलाया गया काफी चीजें आई उस टाइम को अगर आप कभी याद करते होंगे तो आपको स्थिति याद आती होगी क्या हुआ था और किस तरह से क्या था क्या ये टुकड़े करने वाली बात को आप मानते हैं या फिर सारी चीजें सर वो टुकड़े वाली बात तो गलत है सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने भी उसको मना कर दिया कि उसके बॉडी के कोई टुकड़े नहीं हुए थे और जब क्राइम हो जाता है तो क्राइम को बचाने की कोशिश में आदमी और गलतियां करता जाता है क्राइम जैसे हो जाए जब हो जाए उसको स्वीकार कर लेना चाहिए उसको तुरंत एक्सेप्ट कर लेंगे तो वो क्राइम भी कभी नहीं मतलब क्राइम आगे नहीं बढ़ेगा और जितना आपसे हो गया उसकी आप सजा भुगतेंगे जुर्माना जो होगा थोड़ा जिक्र करूंगा सर अगर याद हो माफी चाहूंगा इस बात के लिए पर अगर क्या हुआ था उसमें मैंने आपको बताया कि वो ऑल ड्यू टू पोजेशन में आप जब आदमी पॉजिटिव होता है किसी भी सिचुएशन में तो वो मेरे जैसी सिचुएशन में आ जाता है तो वो मेरी जो पॉजिटिव रेस थी वो जेल में जाने के बाद मैंने जो जेल में पसीना मेरा निकला है चौबीस साल में उसमें वो सारी चीजें निकल के बह गई हैं। Regarding his future plans, despite once being a full-fledged politician, he stated that he would not pursue his career in that direction anymore, and instead had different ideas in mind. आगे क्या प्लानिंग है सर आपकी? क्या राजनीति से जुड़ेंगे या फिर कुछ और सोचा है आपने? नहीं सर, अभी राजनीति का तो दूर-दूर तक कहीं बिल्कुल भी दिमाग में नहीं है। और राजनीति की नहीं, लेकिन सामाजिक मे� कुछ चीजें मेरे दिमाग में हैं उसके लिए मैं कुछ काम करूंगा और एक कॉन्स मैरिजेस मैरिजेस के अंदर काउंसलिंग मस्ट करने के लिए भी मैं कुछ काम करूंगा कि मैरिजेस से पहले तीन तीन महीने की लड़का लड़की काउंसलिंग होनी चाहिए जिससे हम मैरिजेस को बचा सकें जैसी सिचुएशन मैं फंसाऊं वो तो वस्त सिचुएशन mentioned that he had received only five rupees as his reward for his brave actions. Despite making headlines in various media outlets, he now sees the incident as a brief moment of attention. Kunju claimed that the Delhi police did not acknowledge or value his policing abilities, quick response, and vigilance. He opted for voluntary retirement in 2012 and relocated to Kerala to care for his unwell mother. The 51-year-old retired officer shared that while he received an out-of-turn promotion, he was deprived of all the accompanying benefits associated with it. He mentioned being denied a salary increase under the 6th Pay Commission, highlighting that even lower rank constables who joined after him were earning more. Despite holding the position of head constable, Kunju stated that his requests were consistently rejected. On the night of the discovery, Kunju discovered a blood-stained plastic bag nearby containing the remaining parts of Naina's body and was threatened by Sushil and Keshav Kumar. Despite this threat, 
Kunju remained steadfast and fulfilled his duties, including attending court proceedings even after his retirement. His story shows that sometimes even the just are treated poorly when they go against those in power. Do you believe that Sushil shot Naina due to insecurity, or was there something else? Do you think the punishment he received was fitting, or should it have been a death sentence? Let us know your opinion. We would love to hear from you. And if you have any case in mind that you want us to cover, feel free to drop your suggestions in the comment section. Subscribe to our channel, Mysterious 7, to be the first to uncover disturbing cases from around the world. Until next time, stay safe.